G'day everyone, Blake here with another video, and today I'm going to do a species spotlight on a species that I absolutely love. They're my favourite Lake Tanganyikan, Dwarf Cichlid. So let's jump straight into the video and talk about the fry in this box here, and the fish that made them, the Neolampelagus cordopunctatus. Let's jump straight into the video. So to get started, Neolampelagus cordopunctatus, cordopunctatus meaning spotted tail, uh, affectionately nicknamed Cordopunks or Punk Cichlids. These guys have some beautiful coloration, including a yellow to orange dorsal fin, some sapphire blue eyes, a nice white body with some spangling down the sides. Overall, I just really like the look of them and they have a nice temperament to them as well. Cordopunctatus are an easy to medium care species, a dwarf cichlid that's fairly hardy, but they do have some aggression, particularly when breeding. They don't get too big, they're about four inch mark at a maximum or 10 centimeters. So they're not the smallest, but they're also not the biggest fish from Lake Tanganyika. With that said, if you want to keep a group of them, I'd recommend a three foot aquarium or a 30 gallon. I've just got a little breeding uh, quad here. I was just trying to figure out males and females, which we'll touch on later on in this video. So they are in a smaller aquarium and I do intend to upgrade them in the new fish room. In terms of water parameters, they're going to enjoy a temperature of about 72 to 82 degrees Fahrenheit or 22 to 27 degrees Celsius. They're from that Lake Tanganyikan African cichlid water, so they're gonna need a pH high up in the sevens, about 7.8 to nine. And they're gonna enjoy a carnivorous diet, these guys. So in the wild, they live around about the shallows on the edges of Lake Tanganyika, where they're gonna live around larger shells and rock formations and spend their days searching for crustaceans and other critters hiding in amongst the nooks and crannies. They do this also through sifting through substrate to find anything that might be hidden underneath the ground. They do enjoy a carnivorous diet, however, they will readily take to prepared foods such as pellets and flakes, so they're not by any means a species that's difficult to feed and raise in the long term. So in terms of tank setup, you're going to want to keep them in a sandy substrate because they are little mini excavators in the aquarium. You're going to want plenty of rocks and larger shells for them to form a habitat. Cordopunctatus aren't a true shell dweller, they're more of a rock slash shell dweller. So they will live amongst rock formations, but also potentially breed in amongst some larger shells. For that purpose, I've scattered some escargot shells around the aquarium, but in this instance, conveniently for me, I guess, they've actually chosen to breed in a 3D printed hockey puck style cave that I originally designed for epistogrammas, but just dropped one in there and uh, they've decided to breed in that on this instance, so that's pretty cool. I uh, do have these on an Etsy site if you are interested in them. I just thought they were a cool thing to start to incorporate into my fish room, so um, that is something that is available if you're interested. There's a link in the description. The proof is in the pudding in that one. Regardless of the actual cave in itself, they'll prefer secluded areas with a flat spot that they can lay their eggs on, and an entrance which is secluded, and they can push sand up around to make it even more hidden. Neolampelagus cordopunctatus are a really secretive breeding fish. So if you do intend to breed these species, don't be alarmed if you've kept them for a long time, you haven't noticed any obvious behavior or nesting behavior because they'll probably do it very secretive and you won't even know until there's fry swimming around. To get started, if you want to get a few males and females, unfortunately this species is actually monomorphic. There's no real sexual difference between males and females other than the males are gonna get about an inch or 2.5 centimeters larger than the females. Other than that, everything is the same, the same colors and all that sort of thing. So you really have to start with a decent group and wait for them to whittle themselves down into breeding pairs. After that period, they'll find a secluded location, usually in a back corner away from prying eyes. They'll excavate it around, create a nice secluded area and lay their eggs on a surface. The female will actually look after them and she might even kick the male out of the area for this time. She'll look after the eggs really well and they'll hatch within about 48 to 72 hours. After that time, she'll hatch out about 40 to 60 fry and they'll become free swimming after seven days. So she'll do a good job keeping an eye on these until they're at the free swimming stage. But generally speaking, that's about the time that they're ready to breed again. So I would recommend if you want to actually keep the fry alive, actually separating them from the parents because, because when it is time to reload and make some more eggs and uh, fry, they will unfortunately eat up the babies. So I like to take a bit of a siphon and separate at least some of the brood if I wish to grow them up and keep them. 
but I do also like to leave some fry with the parents just so that they do exhibit some of that parenting behavior which I want to encourage and so that they're not too distraught having lost everything that they've just spent the last week trying to keep alive. This is a bit of a stressful time and you might find that they actually attack whatever you're putting in the aquarium to try and get the babies out. In my case, the plastic tube from the siphon, but just try and do it carefully in a calculated way so you don't add any additional stress than you need to. The free swimming fry that you do siphon out will be ready to take baby brine shrimp straight away and they are fairly slow growing, so be patient. I like to use hang on breeder boxes like this one behind me just so that I know the water parameters are exactly the same as the water that they've survived and thrived within. And other than that, it's a pretty easy process. So there you go guys, that is how to keep and breed Neolemprolegus cordopunctitis. Absolutely my favorite Lake Tanganyikan fish. I really, really love those colors, especially on that fin. What's not to love about this fish, and I definitely recommend trying them out if you're in the least bit interested in fish like this. If you've got any further questions, feel free to drop them down below. Hopefully you enjoyed this video, and if you did, it always helps me out to smash like, hit subscribe, and all that fun stuff. Other than that, I'll catch you on the next one. Thanks for watching.